I think you're absolutely right, and I think it, it almost doesn't matter what the issue is. And I think we've learned enough by now that whatever the issue is, it can be reframed. So, the, so that in a sense, it's not about, it's about poison in the water, but it's not about poison in the water. It's about odor, it's about vote fraud, whatever it is, it's really about who's usurping, who's, who's stealing whose rights, who's using the government to deny that somebody else's rights. And each, each of them can be, can be uh, reframed. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny question because, I mean, I, th I think you're absolutely right that it's very hard to do this stuff in the abstract, totally in the abstract. And it's very important to the work that there are communities in, now in Pennsylvania and a few other places which actually are grappling with the theory in order to put it into practice. What does it mean we do every day? What does it mean our organization, you know, where are our resources going? How are we, how are we sort of uh, chronologically, sequentially working this thing out? It's very important. But I would just add that the theory is very important because they got brilliant theorists working all the time, you know, imposing on the culture. I mean, the theory of how things work, what is progress. I mean, go back to the populists. The populists were very clear. They say, we don't accept as progress what the corporate state is bringing to us. We define progress in a very different way. You know, and the same with the abolitionists. They had to, you know, they had to have these discussions in order to figure out what it was to do. So you got to have both. You know, we're not, we're not just automatons who say, oh, we'll go and protest and hang up a sign and we'll march and we'll do this, you know, because someday we're going to win something and if we win it, it damn well better change something or else it cuts, it sets everybody back. You want to add to that? Uh, democracy schools are great because we take the onion and we start peeling it back. Uh, we spend five hours on Pennsylvania. Basically, this happened then, and this happened next, and you have this great eight boxes on this chart to take people through the organizing strategy. But just like Richard mentioned, that the, the whole framework rests on producing more. I mean, that's basically the, the system, and everything else is just an accoutrement or support to that. That has to touch down, and it touches down in real communities, like a cyclone that touches down. You can't have more, more production of pork in smaller hands without touching down someplace geographically. I think the only organizing that counts, the only organizing that works, is geographically based organizing. Because you have a power plant of people defending their families, their homes, their kids, their land. And that's where you get the real surge that you need to go through those boxes and do the reframing and still have people left at the end. And but we just got a small grant uh, last week to do some work around Walmart to take big box store sightings. And instead of getting crammed into being a land use issue, about, well, you have the power to say whether it goes over here or over here, but you don't have the authority to say no. About how to, what, 30,000 square feet? Or 30,000 square feet versus 100,000 square feet. That to take that issue and reframe it into one about authority to be able to say no. Community saying no to a certain type of production, a certain type of retailing. And so that's one of the thousands of single issues that can be reframed. Very, very good <coughs> points. Um, help me to clarify what, what I'm thinking about. I, I think. You know, up until the, the Warren Court, the courts were not real good on civil rights questions. And in fact, were complicit to a large degree in denying African Americans their rights under the law. So something had to change for that to happen. An awful lot of work had to be done. Um, on the, particularly the issues dealing with, with corporate constitutional rights, the courts are pretty, at this point in time, the courts are pretty solid. This stuff is not a question of, an issue of debate in the law schools and it certainly is not an issue of debate in the courts. And that's why, you know, when, when we're submitting briefs like that, they can be just sliced down. They have no merit because there's, there's just no locus of debate yet. And I guess what I, what I should have said more clearly is at this time and for this foreseeable, we shouldn't be relying on the courts, just as African Americans shouldn't have been relying on the courts in 1920s. I mean, they, they, I'm sure Thurgood Marshall, well, they, he knew. They knew that they would have to go through a, a process in order to get some changes. And I think right now, the legislatures, local legislatures, any legislatures, are a much better venue to be in than the courts for many different reasons, because of the mechanics, because it's public, because it's open, uh, because we can elect people and unelect people, theoretically. Um, it's a much better place. Uh, and no matter where we go in terms of the arenas of governance, then there has to be tumult and, 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 and people in the village square and stuff going on, agitations and all that. But I just think, you know, Eventually, the courts will, come, will have to come around, but I think it's, they'll be the last to come around, that the culture will change in some significant way, 
and then the courts will come along. And, you know, maybe there'll be a judge here and there, probably will, a judge here and there will give a good decision, you know, favorable decision. But we're talking about, I mean, just as in, in, in 1954, you're talking about, you know, 180 years of pretty solid judicial solidarity on the question of rights for African Americans or the ability of a few whites, of, 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 the, of the whites to deny, use the law to deny rights. And we're talking of, of, of well over 150, 40 years now, going, and plus the English common law about the rights of corporations. And it's going to take a lot to dislodge the courts given, given you know, who, how they function, who they are, and all that. So, but prove me wrong, that would be terrific. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, reading some of his, uh, his work, understood innately that the courts were political actors. He understood that courts are moved in other ways just by brilliant legal arguments over fine hairs. Uh, and the best example was, uh, I think it was called Burlington Parking Garage case, where uh, sit-in protesters were arrested. Uh, the restaurant called uh, the police to arrest sit-in protesters for trespassing on uh, restaurant property. And the issue before the court was, was the restaurant a private entity, private corporation, or a public actor? And it made a lot of difference, because if it was a public actor, it had to respect the rights of the sit-in protesters, constitutional rights of the sit-in protesters. The way that that argument eventually played out in the Supreme Court in that case was the result of five years of thousands of cases cluttering the docket in which sit-in protesters were advancing the legal proposition that these restaurants and other public places were actually state actors or public actors. The court went through some contorted reasoning to get to that conclusion, not because they wanted to reach the conclusion, but because they had a thousand different cases cluttering the dockets below them. So Thurgood Marshall understood very well, in fact, uh, better than almost anyone litigating during that period, that the courts are political actors and have to be shoved and herded in the right direction, because it's certainly not brilliant legal arguments that make law. It's simply those shared values that are driven in through that process. If, if I could add, those cases were not obscure cases. Those were cases coming out of the activism of the civil rights movement with lawyers like Kunstler and Kanoi and all that, you know, highly publicized with lots and lots of folks all the time. And so there was tremendous pressure on every branch of government, and in, in particular, and one of, the one of the branches in which the pressure was being brought in a very orchestrated way was, in fact, the federal courts. Um, so. Yes, we have worked with the PERGs, and no, it's not the Takaja transition stuff that, that I think is the work that needs to be done, because it doesn't raise any of the larger questions. We've drafted bad boy laws. In fact, we got our start with three strikes and you're out uh, ordinances, uh, which was some of the very early work that we did in 1996 and 1997. The problem is you're relying on other places to decide what violations are and what breaches of law are, and so you're still focusing on the illegal behavior, not the lawful behavior. But in addition, it doesn't lead to anything. Uh, it basically says everything's fine, we just need to make sure we put repeat offenders in a different category, but we're going to rely on illegal behavior instead of lawful behavior. And so it focuses people in a, in a certain place where they don't question all of the well-settled law and they don't question corporate rights and they don't question that stuff. And so it's like conventional organizing taken to the next best, highest level. Conventional organizing taken to the next best level. It's basically doing the same thing, but doing it better. And so when I critique it, I'm critiquing our own work too, because we actually put those laws into place in some municipalities in Pennsylvania. And they were effective in a couple places in keeping things out, but they didn't lead to anything long-term in terms of rethinking or uh, doing uh, fundamental work. I mean, just to go back to something that Tom said during his talk, that the principal product of the work in Pennsylvania of passing these ordinances, provoking a response from the politicians and the corporation to come back and say, not it should be 10 parts per billion over six, but come back and saying, you have no right, your elected representatives have no right to pass such a law in order to define your community. The, passing a bill like that, they'll oppose it, but it won't be on those grounds. I mean, and it won't then open up the issue so that it escalates so that the product is more people learning out of it. Because frankly, what's happened in other states or places that have passed those laws, the laws are in place and then a lot of people say, oh, some aspect of the problem has been taken care of, I can go home now. 
We want the exact opposite response. We want the confrontation, in fact, to bring more people forward because they hear these very important people in their ties and everything, no offense to their tie. The, they hear these people come and say, you can't do that, this is no democracy, you have no rights. And that's the driving force here. So what, how can you frame a, a piece of legislation? If you're strong enough to pass a piece of legislation, or to get it in there to have that struggle, how do you frame it in a way that forces these people to come back and say, that's totally off the agenda, it's totally contrary to history, to law, it's frivolous, it's this, it's that, it's stupid. That's what you want them to say. You don't want to de debate the merits of a three strikes, one strike, five strikes, because that doesn't go anywhere. Sorry. We have time for one more question, unfortunately. And then we're being closed down, so. Not in a formal way yet, because we haven't had really time to codify this stuff, but there has been talk about doing curriculum uh, for uh, mostly elementary school level. Uh, but I guess at the end of the, end of the day, it's the practicing of democracy by the parents, by the families, that translate the values most effectively to the kids. That's what I've seen, at least. And uh, the democracy schools, uh, amazingly enough, uh, just that they're filled and overflowing and people are trying to get in them. Uh, but we had a 15-year-old student, for example, come to the one in Boston. And he went back to his school and, and began working on some stuff there to gather students together. So I think it's going to happen, but it's going to happen organically in some sense. And it's going to take other folks besides us, probably, because we need a bigger army to do the, the stuff. And it's got to be somebody whose focus is on school-age uh, kids and then using the examples to basically teach something. Uh, but that's about as good an answer I can give. What, 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 I, what about the media actually reporting? Is this happening at the, uh, at the local level? Is it becoming sort of public knowledge or awareness? Yes. Uh, the local papers in Pennsylvania have been covering it. Uh, the reporters have been following it. And, uh, uh, we made it into the New York Times uh, a couple weeks ago about stripping away local control in Pennsylvania. Uh, now with Bill Moyers uh, is covering one of our cases. It's going to air on Friday of next week. Uh, it's been very slow for the national media stuff to catch on. The, the local stuff is penetrating. It's deep. It's comprehensive, especially stuff about the corporate rights ordinances. And so people through internet, I mean, it's all that stuff circulated now across Pennsylvania, but there's a shared consciousness that's growing, but it's certainly not coming from the you know, Los Angeles Times or the, you know, it's coming from the real local papers who are usually locally owned who are writing about the stories of their own neighbors in the community. And, and I think that's actually a good thing. I think, I think it, would be, it would be a disaster if there was a big national glare spotlight on Pennsylvania prematurely. I mean, this, we're talking about 70 townships out of how many? 1,400. 1,400. We're talking about a beginning. It's, a, it's significant. It's important. It's exciting. But it's a beginning. And, and sort of the corollary to that is, and that's why one of the reasons we're doing democracy schools in other places and why we're speaking in other places, and we, you know, not through the press, but directly. Because if over the next four or five years, even if they expand in Pennsylvania and, and they're in hundreds of townships, if that work or similar kind of creative work the challenging some fundamental stuff is not beginning to happen in other communities around the country, they're going to be crushed. They cannot, they cannot stand alone in, in, in one part of one state, even if they expand there. So we're looking for not just cover, that's a little crass. You know, we need the cover, but in fact, we think this is, this is not the model, not, you know, the end of the model, but it's, it's an example that can provoke people to, to use your creativity and your own experience to start coming up stuff that, in fact, sets the, some of the similar dynamics in motion that begin to escalate. Um, and that, in fact, should be very exciting to younger people. It's much more exciting to do this work than to, in fact, be fighting to say, oh, we'd rather have a few less you know, parts per billion of this poison in our community than more to sense, in, instead to say, we don't want this. And in fact, we have, we're seizing the authority to say that this can't happen here. It's a much more energy, it releases a lot more kind of energy, which should in fact, at some point, begin to attract the younger people that are needed for this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, how would we know since they're doing that already today? You know? um, I think, you know, if you, you, you want to sort of speculate on that, go, go read American history. I mean, they, the, the, the record of what the corporate class is, first the slave master class has done to hang on, to gain their power and hang on, and what the corporate class has done 
is pretty well documented. They've done everything possible. Um, I mean, to the extent that they are the government, they will use public, public legal violence, you know? I mean, look at, look at the history. If you, if you compare the history of, of labor trying to agglomerate, you know, to organize, and capital trying to organize, and you look at the amount, if you only look at the amount of violence used by the state, you know, the militia, the army, the jails, the police against labor, and you look at the way the state has enabled and helped capital all that way, I mean, it'll give you some sense. You know, they use the judge, you got injunctions, you got the courts, you got, you got whatever. Uh, and then this barrage, you know, given corporate, corporations spend, what, a trillion dollars a year on, on, on advertising. I mean, most of it is advertising not a product but a way of life, you know, the culture and all that way to think and all that. Um, they already, you know, on a, a job blackmail, I wrote a book once uh, on, on job blackmail, you know, whatever, you know, threatening, we'll, we'll, we'll shut down and we'll move away. You know, it's an effective strategy if, in fact, people allow, we allow parts of the community to be split off. You know, workers, you know, phony categories, workers against environmentalists, as if workers don't breathe and drink water and, and all that. So I think, you know, I think everybody in this room can, can pretty much predict what would happen. I'm sure there'll be a lot of creative stuff. Uh, but ultimately, you know, as in this, as in the sanctions thing that I read, you know, I think that they're, you know, it sounds a little hyperbolic when they say that this, this claim made in the lawsuit is threatening, you know, the fundamental of the socioeconomic way of life. And I think many of those folks, you know, actually believe that. And if that's what's at stake, they'll do whatever they need to do to defend it. Well, that's up to that's up to the people duly assembled to 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 work that out, you know. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about very much tonight is in our own history the different visions that you know people always weren't on the defensive. People, in fact, were organized and putting forward very different visions of how people can come together and organize a society. I mean, there was very significant all through the 19th century, put forward by many different aspects. You know that in fact co cooperation instead of competition as a fundamental value. You know, production for use and not for maximizing sales in order to maximize profits every, everywhere. You know, keeping things local and decentralized and, and, and all that. Very different kinds of outlooks. Um, you know, if, you know, it's not up to me to, to come out with, with what the rules are, but if in fact we, we start working more democratically, and then people say, well, what is it we want and what is it we need and how do we want to produce them? I mean, right now, how we produce products is off the public agenda. They're private decisions. We have no authority. And you can see that more, more starkly in the, in the global so-called trade agreements. Because in the global trade agreements, the language is very explicit. Whereas here, it's sort of, it's sort of case law and doc, corporate doctrine. That the, the, the global treaties cannot address the question of how a product is produced and how labor is organized. It may not address that subject. So then they go, and that's why, that's why the phoniness of putting these labor and environmental side agreements is just like bullshit regulation, regulating how many people are going to be killed and how many people are exploited. So, but that's the core of American law since, since the 1880s or so, that that is private law. It's off the agenda. Our elected officials have no authority to address those questions. And, um, you know, so we have, to, we have to take that, we have to seize that authority and say, well, we'll decide in some democratic fashions. Uh, what's going to be made and how it's made. People who are not under coercion and people who are not under coercion, you know, and not being blackmailed and not being threatened and, and you know, people who have health, you know, you know, what are people without coercion? Well, people who have health care and people who have food and people who have housing and, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to pull out one little thread from a lapel, you know, the whole suit's going to unravel here. And it's the same, I mean, really, the other comparison to the slave state, that in 1820 or 30, you started really looking at the slave system, the slave institution, and you started pulling on one little thread, it unraveled everything because it was so central. We're in an equivalent situation here. We live in a corporate state, in a corporate culture. We have a corporate constitution. It's so central that you pull anywhere real, I mean, you get beyond the, the, the 
the argument of a parts per million or the, how much odor is okay and how many deaths and workers is acceptable, but you start pulling the thread out over rights and self-governance, right? And you hold it up to what, what Martin Luther King called, you know, the grand language of the founding documents, you know, not the bullshit performance, but the grand language. You start pulling those threads, everything comes, comes loose. And that's what they're starting to do in Pennsylvania. They're pulling the thread and things are coming loose and we'll see how it evolves. I would uh, even go so far that it doesn't matter what Richard Grossman or Tom Lindsay think or say. Uh, at a funder once asked me, well, where's all this headed? What's the end goal? Where are we? And, and I look back and I said, it doesn't matter what, what I think the end goal is. We involve 5 million, 10 million, 15, 20 million people in this conversation. It's people that decide where this stuff goes. Otherwise, we're just as bad as anybody else in the back room saying, hey, we're going to cut this deal for how we think things should be done. In reality, all this work is about doing is creating a safe space for a process to arise where people voluntarily decide how they want to order their lives and what priorities they're going to give to what the Sioux Indians used to call the flying people and the swimming people uh, and the other ecos and ecosystems and animals on the planet. I mean, I uh, think I have a loose vision for where, and since we've gone this far, we might as well go the rest of the way. The fact is, is that communities are going to begin writing their own constitutions. And just like the abolitionists were drafting the language of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments back in the 1830s, okay, 30 to 40 years before the language hit the subcommittee and the committee that was drafting the amendments, that they were tooling the language and building a movement to back the language. But right now, we're at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, where communities are beginning to draft their fundamental governing frameworks, these constitutions, which eventually, 40 years from now, 30 years from now, will result in states rewriting their constitutions. And eventually, 50 years, whatever the time period, we can imagine, if we have that long on this planet, this planet doesn't blow up on us, that the federal constitution will have to be rewritten. I myself, as never thought I'd be here, I'm beyond amending the thing. I think we need a full-blown constitutional convention at the federal level, but that should, that, oh, in the church, that stuff doesn't happen unless it's driven underneath, and it's got to be forced by enough states doing it. Well, how do you get enough states to do it? You've got to have 5,000 communities underneath who are writing this stuff and saying, these are our values, these are our communities, and driving it upwards. I think that's roughly, you know, in the cosmos where I am. retooling and rewriting the fundamental framework of governance for this country. I mean, I think that's what it's going to take. But you don't hear that anywhere else. So. <clears throat> Thank you.